It's February 2022, and this is Core Talk, the Norfolk District U.S. Army Corps of Engineers official podcast. I'm your host, Andy, bringing you another month of the people, projects, and programs that you've grown to know and just adore. And this month, we're talking about the broad topic of leadership. More specifically, leaders, the good ones, the bad ones, and everything in between. We're looking to see how empowering our leaders helps us deliver our projects and deliver our mission, as well as creates that positive command climate in the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Now for segment one, we're using the LDP as our subject. So that's the Leadership Development Program. And I got the chance to talk to three folks who are already in leadership positions here at the district but they're in this program to continue refining their skill sets. And they have some interesting takes on what they've done in the past, how things are going now, and what they would like to see in the future. Now, I have to say, I did not prep these people. It's gonna sound like I did, because the stuff that comes out of their mouths is is so on point, but I promise this is all organic content. I did not tell them what to say, they are just that awesome. And then you're going to hear segment two, where I talk to Mike Anderson, who is the chief of the design section of our operations branch. And we start talking about uh, the Norfolk Harbor deepening project, but then we get into some of his thoughts about being a leader in his section. And the cool part is you're going to see a lot of parallels between the folks I speak to in segment one and what Mike has to say in segment two. So again, it's gonna sound like I prepped them, I didn't, I promise. If you can't trust your favorite podcast host, I mean, who can you trust? So in segment one that we're gonna start off with, I speak to Eartha Garrett, who is a supervisory contract specialist, Barry Kimbrough, who is one of our project managers, and Jory Bunn, who is a supervisory civil engineer. as you were first starting to lead people. I want to know from like the bottom up, a little bit about your, each of your stories. How, like, what was your first experience leading folks? And how did, like, what did you learn along the way? Um, so I'm going to actually see if Eartha will, will start us off. Okay, no problem. Be happy to. Uh, when I first started leading people, I truly believe mine started with an outside organization where I ended up being the president over 130 individuals. Well, that's what I thought. But when I look back over my life, (laughs) I realize leadership can start as early as when you're in school, in different organizations, in school. and, and, And I've noticed that I've always had this ability to end up in the leadership role. I was never afraid. I was always willing to ask questions. If someone else had served before me in a position, or and if I even felt as if I was interested in that position, I believe in doing my research, go talk to that person, uh, get advice as to, hey, how can I get to where you are? Now, fast forward to when I really became a real paid (laughs) leader. I, again, you always have individuals that will assist you. The first thing as a leader that I always tell people is don't be, number one, you have to listen. You have to listen to your audience. You may be the branch chief supervisor or in that top leadership role, but you remember you're only as good as the people that are working under you. So if you will not even listen to what their feelings are on different subjects or I have this suggestion and you never want to take heed to the suggestion, you're not going to go far. And and it's funny because as you were talking, I actually wrote listen and learn before you even said to listen. And I, I, I love that. How do you separate the quality suggestions from like all the good idea fairies or do you? So to me, you can, 
most of the time you can find some useful advice out of anything that anyone presents to you. It's all in your mindset. And like I said, if you're really to, willing to listen and both of you have open and honest dialogue and communication, I promise you, you can find something that you could utilize and that encourages them. Uh, Jory, I saw you, you, you shaking your head. You were like in agreement with Eartha. So I want to know what were you thinking as she was talking and, and Eartha was saying, you know, listen, because there's always something that you can learn um, almost and maybe maybe be a little humble yeah. uh, as people come to you. So what do you think, George? You know, I've, I've, I've realized that I was a leader at a, kind of what Earth was saying, a young age. You know, you, you kind of, you know, you get involved, you follow, you become a leader. You get involved, you follow, you become a leader. And you start noticing that pattern. But for myself, I do the same exact thing. I listen, no matter their background, age, like completely. I, I always like to hear them out completely because you can just pull very, very valuable pieces of information from them. And they always seem like they have a perspective that you, uh, that they can share that you may not. Um, to keep yourself humble enough to, to realize, hey, at the end of the day, I may not have all the perspectives, but you know, if I have the ability to listen, I'm able to be an effective leader. So Barry, now, um, and we're still kind of going up what, what Eartha said, but I want to know a little bit of you coming up through the ranks and I, I use that phrase on purpose, coming up through the ranks, because we know, you know, you, you came up through the, you, you're a Marine. And uh, I don't know if that was your first time leadership, but it's very, a, a great example of leadership. In order to be a good leader, you got to be able to be a good follower too. I've, I've heard that all my life. And I've been able to do that in scouting, in sports, in the military, uh, in private sector, and now back in, uh, in the government sector. Right now, I, I'm challenged to be the leader of the PDTs, and that's challenging enough right now. The, because folks don't report to me, but I need them to work with me. We need to work as a team to get the project done from A to A to Z. If I didn't have the leadership experience that I've had over my career, I don't think I could be a successful project manager here. It's very challenging, and there's very uh, much competing priorities. And in order to get the project in the direction you want and the outcome you want, you really need to be able to uh, compel the team members to follow you and your plan to get the project done. So, Pete Opsori and, and Eartha, yeah, you got to be able to listen. Uh, however, sometimes when people are talking, they may they may not be really talking about some way to improve something. They may be talking about some way to do it that, because they don't agree with the way you're doing it. So you got to have a keen ear and understand a little bit. You know, you have to know about the folks that you're working with and the folks that you're leading to know, is there something more there? Mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a that's a skill that takes a long time to develop unless oh, it took a long time for me to develop. Because when I first came in the military, I was always, you know, telling the Lance Corporals to, hey, no, just go, go move that stuff, go, go clean your gear, whatever. When it comes to doing something like it, an operation or an exercise, then you know it's important. Hey, they're really into it. They're part of the team. They want to be uh, participatory and contributory. So yes, a good leader does need to listen and uh, take all, take all those uh, inputs and uh, continue to drive forward for meeting the mission. The thing that I will say that has helped me a lot was getting involved in general. You know, just having the desire to get out there, you know, get uncomfortable to get comfortable. Um, it's okay to not necessarily know everything going into, uh, you know, a new experience, but you can definitely gain a lot out of it from just being in it. And as a leader, you know, just having that, that I guess, lack of a better word, being brave enough to trust yourself and get involved and learn things is, is part of leadership itself. So those that, you know, really, really want and truly desire to be a leader, you know, you got to be willing to get involved and, you know, trust, trust your judgment, trust yourself and just get out there and experience something new. So I just want to make sure that that was said because that's what helped me a lot in my career. So I am, I'm, I'm pulling a couple things together and the three of you, as I'm writing down, and it started with Eartha, but then each of you actually, supported it through your through your own story is first thing is always be learning 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 about your people from your people just always be open to learn 
about the situations. Um, make sure you're listening, actually truly listening. And I guess that relates to learning as well. And the third thing is staying humble. So a good place to start. So for our, for our you know, individual, our, our GS11, who wants to start working on their leadership skills, we're first gonna tell them to learn, listen, stay humble. Does that sound like a good place to start? I think that sums it up nicely. Excellent, yep. excellent. And Barry, you said something that really, um, what coming into this, um, this podcast segment, I've been thinking a lot about is just to touch on my experience. What I learned is, well, you mentioned, you know, being a supervising people isn't always fun. It's not like the fun spot to be in, right? And in public nope. affairs, <laughs> Earth is laughing. I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I was laughing. <laughs> I and I remember, like, with me, you know, when I were, had my first troop, like when I was truly, you know, had a bunch of people I was responsible for, I wasn't the one out there winning the awards. I wasn't the one out there like really progressing super fast. And I was, because a lot of my time was spent raising, training and, and taking care of others. So, I mean, let's talk about that because I think that's, there's always that desire, right? For that next uh, step or, or GS level because the money's better. I mean, let's be honest. Um, but what do you think as far as, I don't want to say it becomes less fun. It's like being enlisted versus officer. Like if you've had both jobs, you might say, ah, oh, being enlisted was a lot more fun than having to be the, 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 the gal or guy in, in charge of everybody. Well, in the military, it, actually, it's not just in the military. It, to be a good leader, you, you need to set the good example. You, and you need, to, you need to show people that you care about them even though you're doing the tough stuff, you know, even if you're out in the field and on exercises or, or if you're an operational in, in war, um, you got to, you got to show them that you're, you will always do the right thing so you can earn their trust and respect, but you also need to tell them, I, I trust you and I respect you, but you, you need to make sure that, you know, we're following the, the ethical and moral and um, you know all, all the regulations, and that doesn't matter if you're an officer or enlisted, and it doesn't matter if you're a junior enlisted or a senior enlisted, junior officer or senior officer, or a senior civilian, junior civilian. In in, in any organization, um, there's going to be people that aren't aren't paid as much and have harder jobs in their mind because they have to do all the scut work. And to be a good leader, you need to make sure that they understand how they fit into the into the machine, how they fit into the system, and that that you they're appreciated for what they do, and they are uh, valued for what they do, and not all not all people in leadership positions do that. I mean, I've I've had so many bad bosses in the military, and in the civilian world, and the people that I I call the bad bosses are the ones that thought of themselves first, and that they talked about themselves or have to do it my way, or yeah, I don't care about that regulation because I, I'm in charge here, or this is my company and you're going to do it how I want it done. Seeing people leave, leave because of, you know, not that and the organization's wrong. It's, it's typically somebody in leadership is wrong. And I'm going to, I'm going to talk to earth about this. And, and cause you know, that whole being a selfless leader and, and Barry, I love that you brought that up because just as, I mean, when you think about good boss, bad boss, like I think we've all had a, that bad boss, that man just maybe gives us anxiety in our chest or makes us a little stick to our stomach. But then you've also had that one person maybe who gave you that chance that, and you were like, what? And that changed your career or that helped you when you were having a hard time with your family. And, but um, you know, and, but being on that, and I understand it's not so black and white, good and bad, but, um, Let's talk about selflessness, uh, and we normally, you know, associate that with a more positive experience with our bosses. What, talk to me, Eartha, about what being a selfless leader means to you, or an example from your experience. Okay, to me, a selfless leader means that you put your your team above your needs. Um, you want to ensure that they are okay, 
you want to ensure I am a big family oriented person, my own self, but just like I feel like I love my family, I feel like they love their family. We all are, we all are smart enough to know, yes, we need these jobs, but my top priority is not this job. And, and I, I say that often. So when I did hear, hear Barry speak on being selfless, he is so right. This being a leader, most of the time, you will not be compensated for the skill set that you provide. So if you're getting into it for the money, you will really have a horrible time because you give so much more of yourself. And more of yourself does not just mean money-wise. It also means time. I take a lot of time with, you have, most of us are, are, are managing six individuals, five to six individuals. That's a lot of people. In addition to you still have to do your duty. See, your only duty is not just to be a manager. So very selfless, I know it's just like doing during COVID. COVID is just a, well, that's what we have going on. That's the hottest topic going on right now. During COVID, we were all accustomed to being together for Christmas and celebrating and all of that in the office. Well, you couldn't do that. What did I do for my team members? All of a sudden their doorbell was ringing. I had pizzas delivered to everybody's home. So that way we could we could share some, you know, we could still hold on to what we used to do. Since we could, we could not go out to lunch, most restaurants were closed. Um, and, and at that time, this is, and I'm speaking from when the uh, COVID numbers were very, very high. So I know that it was a good call that the district made, that they even allow us to go home. We were very blessed in that, of having that type of support. But I still wanted to ensure that my people knew that I was thinking about you. And I didn't want to just send, you could always send a gift card. But I was like, well, they have families, they have children. What thing does children love? Pizza. And I already knew who was, who only didn't eat meat. I got everything according to what, what individuals like. Yeah. Because Earth is like, I know, I know, I, I know your blood yeah. type. I know, you know, if yeah. you have marital sex, and it, I know if you have any injuries. I'm... <laughs> be, because who do you spend the majority of the time with? Your coworkers. That sounds crazy, but it's the truth. So therefore, you. You, again, it's going back to listening. You listen to what people like. And so I wanted to ensure that I was able to just let them know I was thinking about them and this, and everything can't be about work. Every now and then you, you can't be, okay, what is the status of this project? What is this? You know, we're getting beat up all around by ensuring that we provide uh, a project on time. So sometimes you just need to just calm down and just realize, let's just keep this on a human level and let this just be, make, give them the feeling that this is about you now. This is about your family. And that's the only way that I could think to do. I didn't even realize that Pizza Hut could deliver to all these different uh, addresses. And I mean, I had one person over in Williamsburg. I had it all set up. That's awesome. So. I think I think I'm gonna adopt the the mantra um, what would Eartha do? Because I, I feel like that would probably be a good litmus <laughs> test to check. Joey, so tell me, tell me about selfless, selfless leadership um, as it applies to you or your experience or your thoughts. Yeah, um, just being a selfless leader, in, in my opinion, and, you know, just going off of Again, you know, we're all kind of saying the same thing, but, you know, it takes, a, you know, it's a lot of hard work. Uh, you have to be patient. Um, you have to sacrifice um, a lot. Um, but most of all, you have to just kind of love it and love what you're doing. Um, you know, really show your people that, you know, you do care and, you know, that you are interested in what they're doing. And, you know, just know that at the end of the day, just be, you know, absolutely truthful about yourself and what you do. And you just, you know, continue to know what's right and what's wrong and uh, just take yourself um, out of it. You know, um, it's it's really um, great to think of everybody as a team. But what does that truly mean? I mean, it truly, truly means, you know, not necessarily putting your needs first, you know, hearing everybody's needs and, and just accommodating, 
and uh, reacting or, you know, solving those issues. You know, you're, you're there, you know, not necessarily, like you said, for all the skill sets that you could bring to the table, but, you know, to be a selfless leader. And, and that's what it really means to me. So, yeah. And sometimes it's, um, it's taking the heat, right? being that person who can be in the shield um, the right way, but not in fear, like, oh, you know, okay, someone's got my back. I'm going to ask each of you for a uh, for piece of advice uh, for me is how do I develop right now as a non in a non supervisory GS 11 position? How do I develop um, my leadership abilities right now? What can I be working on? What can I be doing? Uh, what should I be reading? You know, what do you recommend? Um, I don't know if you're talking about staying as in, in Army Corps. And if, they, if that's the case, then, you know, you should be volunteering for everything that you can in exposing yourself to every situation. And kind of Jory said, to get to be in an uncomfortable position so you can be exposed to more and show that you're in, you have initiative and you're craving for knowledge and craving for more, uh, I guess, uh, you want more and you want to help out more. And along those lines, I would take every bit of training you can take uh, to broaden your horizon uh, and your, your, your exposure to anything and everything that's Army Corps. Um, and I would, I would look for some of those uh, temporary detail positions uh, to, to take on board and show that you're, uh, you say you're a company guy or a company girl, but I mean, you're, you're a core employee and you want to remain a core employee and you want a career with the core so all right Eartha lay some lay some of your uh, sage wisdom on me okay first and foremost one thing that I constantly do is I read I I love reading I don't know how I've managed to fit it into my busy schedule but I read a lot of leadership books not only do I read a lot of leadership books I also, I'm very fortunate where I, I do have two adult sons. One is a vice president and another one is a director of a, at a Fortune 500 company. We, it sounds strange, but a lot of times we collaborate and I get a lot of feedback from them. They get feedback from me. And I realize it's, cer it's certain things that I have implemented here uh, for, my, for my branch that really has worked. Like one thing I do, is I do what I call a 10 for 10, which means once a week, we have a dedicated schedule for all of the team members. I meet with each one of them individually. They have 10 minutes to speak and they can talk on any subject, whether it's just, they might need some assistance with a project. They may just want to vent about something, uh, whatever the case may be. They have the first 10 minutes to, um, you know, uh, provide me feedback like that. And then I take the last 10 minutes and then I can, you know, address their, uh, their concerns. I could assist them with whatever they may be having a, um, need some assistance with. And I, I let it be known from the get go. It does not have to all be work related. It can be any subject matter that you want it to be. What I'm finding out that is work because it's only 20 minutes if you stop and think. And like I said, we don't try if you don't use up the whole 20, that's fine. But this gives you the opportunity to let you know that you always have a way to reach Eartha. Because a lot of times, so so many people feel like they can't get to their uh, manager. But I'm here because... Eartha, <laughs> can I get my 10 minutes with you? <laughs> can I? I would love to have, you know, I'm not an LDP, I don't mention, but I would love to have 10 minutes every other week with you and just be like, how would you deal with this problem? Well, but like I tell people, when you're in the positions that all of us are on, on this call right here, no matter what, every day you are mentoring. That never stops. It never stops. You are always mentoring. And that's just something that is near and dear to my heart. And and I really take pride in it. And you were saying like for an individual like you, what can you do to get to get in a leadership role? I would say the LDP program, that's the purpose of the leadership development program. 
I just I, put that I, in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Mary. Wait, oh, I didn't even that. see that. Oh, yeah. He's an and he's done for LDP. And it was like yeah. you two are, I don't know, Barry yeah. and Earth are like of one mind right now. <laughs> you know, I'm I'm actually getting the vibes that I'm like, okay, I could I could definitely work for Barry or Jory because I see that our, well, I mean, and that's good. And I mean, we actually are just meeting from being in the LDP program. Really? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I knew yeah. of them from being in meetings, but when did we really have to have so much interaction? I'm telling you, because it's like you yeah, three, I'm taking these notes, and you three are saying that you're, I mean, the broad themes are the same. You you guys say them different ways, but I mean, I keep going back to listen, learning, you know, listening, learning, listening, learning, listening, learning, like this, maybe that's the, listen and learn. Maybe it's it's that simple, a, a good starting ground for anybody who's interested in in supervising people just start hone those listening skills and 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 keep learning so jory like what do you what is your piece of advice for me my friend <laughs> so yeah um my advice would be patience goes a long way into being a leader and um you know just just know that you know you, you do have time to think and you do have time to make a decision uh but patience is key and 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 Hone your patient skills would be my advice. Jory has a thing, and I, what, he, I mean, and he said it before. He's like, it's okay to, or I think, well, Barry and Jory both said it in a certain way. Like, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Like, you should look for opportunities to be uncomfortable. And when I was writing that down, I was like, just to me, that's in, in one word, I think, like, be brave. Like, be brave. Just have, yes. a, have a moment of being brave, you know, being uncomfortable or do, you know, because it is, it's it's scary to do something new. It's scary to put yourself out there. I mean, especially in a leadership position, because you fail, if you fail, and we've all failed, but failing in public is <laughs> it's tough and scary. And you feel like, what if I make the wrong move and I lose all credibility? So, yeah, I, I think that's like being brave, you know, and, and being brave and trust your gut maybe is part of it. So, but to But to fail is not bad because you have to remember, it's all sorts of types of failing. As long as you're not getting caught in a lie because you just told a untruth and therefore it failed, that's how you learn. You don't, you get nothing in life without failing at something. In order to reach that goal that you're trying to get to, you're gonna fail somewhere along the line. But my thing is, how do you think you learn? If everything went well for you 100% of the time, if every suggestion you made, it worked out, I mean, really and truly, that's just not realistic. You're going to fail at something, but it's, about, it's about how you handle the failure. And as long as you were truthful in what you were doing, it's okay. Sometimes you really had, you thought a good plan and you felt like this would work and you don't know until you try it. So it's not always bad to fail. That's how you learn and it makes you a better and stronger leader. Any follow-ups on that, Barry? So I'm going to take it right back to the climate of engagement and good leadership, a good organization with good leadership is going to allow failure to happen as mm -hmm. long as it doesn't, you know, destroy the company. They're going to allow small, small little goof ups because you got to, and that, that's where you got to give the trust, maybe trust, but verify, but you can't just be, 100% tyrant and demand everything, you know, without letting folks grow and learn and give them a little bit of latitude. And if they don't make the right call, as long as it's, you know, as long as nobody got hurt and you didn't break a law, um, okay, you, you got to, that's one way to to grow. And like I, like I said earlier, be, be uncomfortable in position that you're in so you can learn more and perform critical thinking on some things to try to figure out the, you know, how, how to do this new thing that I'm not sure about. So, yeah, I, I can't add much more to what Jory and, and Eartha said, though. So I just want to recap some of the things that I we pulled out of the three of you who are, who apparently share a brain, <laughs> if you didn't know, um, is, you know, listening and learning and then being brave and take that chance. As long as you do the check, make sure it's ethical, moral, financially okay and legally okay, don't be afraid. Does that, did I miss anything? Or is there anything you guys wanna to add to that before I, I let y'all go? 
I think for me that that really summed it up nicely. Okay. All right. I got to make t-shirts up. <laughs> we all need t-shirts. Well, That's again, right. <laughs> I got to thank you guys. This was really, I, I mean, I would like to do this again with this group. I think it's, it's, it's truly fascinating as somebody coming in and hearing you guys talk and maybe use different verbiage or examples, but all come to the same conclusion. So obviously there's something, there is a reason why the three of you are in this class together and something that got you guys to where you are. Just a heads up for this next segment with Mike Anderson, the chief of our design section. We were in compliance with the mask policy at the time and decided to take our interview outdoors so we didn't have to wear the masks and got a clearer, uh, clear a sound. So you will we'll pick up some of that uh, natural outdoor sound during the interview, but it's not going to take away from any of the great content. Your team been doing, or what, what are the, some of the hot items of late that job been up to? Sure. So my teams, uh, for of course, it's the the design section, operations branch is where we have all of the engineers and the project managers for our operation and maintenance work. Uh, but we also are lead technical teammates for jobs that are not necessarily in the O and M world, like the deepening project, you know, for Norfolk Harbor Channel. The projects that we have going on right now that are that are taking the majority of our time are. Norfolk Harbor and Channel Deepening Project. That's the development of the plans and specs for the Channel to Newport News and the Norfolk Harbor Inner Channels Project. That's currently in the agency technical review phase. Um, so that's about to go to advertising very soon. Uh, you know, we're also working on the Atlantic Ocean Channel uh, Project, which is a, and, and these are both elements that the federal government are going to execute. The Port Authority are doing other um, aspects of the deepening, but we're focusing on the inner harbor elements as well as the Atlantic Ocean Channel. Um, we are working right now on the James River IDIQ SATOC, which is a new contract for the James River for maintenance stretching. It's going to be a three or five year contract. Joe McMahon is the project manager for that. He's doing a great job. I mean, they're all doing a great job, but um, going back to the Atlantic Ocean Channel and the inner harbor deepening, Stephen Powell, Ian Oleana, Tom Lehman, they're all teammates working technical assignments for that job. And then we have Jake Landis, who's, who's new. Uh, he's working the Skiffs Creek Third Improvements Project, uh, where John Jones is the project manager. For the layman's term. Yeah. Like, we know there's dredging and stuff going on in Norfolk, but the district has been doing that. So what's going to be different? So the James River has a time of year restriction on it where we're not allowed to dredge. And we're not allowed to dredge from um, 15 February to 1 July. So we have to develop some strategies where the time frame where we can dredge, 1 July to 14 February, that we're on the river the whole time being as effective and efficient as we can to remove the shoals. That's the, that's the big push. The current contract is about to expire in March. So during this window where we're not allowed to dredge, we have to put a new contract in place. I get it. Okay, so you're using the quote-unquote off time while the Atlantic Surgeon is doing its thing. Right. <laughs> Figure out how can we do this better. Um, one of the challenges that we're facing right now and, and that I'm involved in is just putting together some strategies uh, to advance our technical work and sequence that with a contracting acquisition timeline and funding timeline to work with the project manager and the Port Authority to try to accelerate that work the best we can, but still provide sound technical documents. Um, I know I didn't go into a lot of detail, but um, you know the Port Authority, based on our funding stream and based on their needs, um, are wanting us to accelerate um, some design schedules. So just working with the entire team, and that's not just design section. You know that's the Port Authority. That's their AE firms that they have armed to. That's our Office of Counsel, our Contracting Office, our Cost Engineers, um, our Environmental Managers. It's just trying to work with the Project Managers to help them um, build that uh, team and have that team working efficiently to, I suppose, deliver 
Now, is that for the harbor deepening, or is that for the three that we? That is for so that is for the Norfolk Harbor and Channels and Channel to Newport News plans and specifications, which is going through ATR, as well as uh, starting on the Atlantic Ocean Channel. Um, so the so the challenge is the reason why we're wanting to accelerate the work is because we need um, sand or borrow material from the Channel to Newport News project and from the Atlantic Ocean Channel project to bring it to Craney Island to build capacity to make capacity for dredging the Norfolk Harbor Inner Channels project. Getting it now. Okay. So because I remember hearing with the you know, the, the, the placement site, the crane island was, I'm going to put in super lame in terms where it was full. So you're, you're, you're expanding crane island? Is that kind of like a... Well, we're building capacity to be able to accommodate the deepening project as well as other users of the facility. So at the end of the deepening project, we're not in a supply deficit as we are right now. So it's finding a solution both short term and long term to be able to build the deepening project and then provide capacity for the users in the Port of Virginia. And, I, and what I didn't mention is Ian, uh, yeah, I, I think I mentioned Ian Uliana earlier, but he's the project manager for the Craney Island O&M project and we have geotechnical exploration ongoing. We have dike raising ongoing. We have sand reclamation ongoing, and he's, you know, he's facilitating all of that. But it's 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 really synchronizing the work he's doing with the deepening to come up with a schedule that's working for everybody. Man, how do you keep all that? <laughs> so to me, that's the challenge right now. Absolutely. And again, it's really all hands on deck to to uh, make that work. Awesome. All right, so we're looking at. Nova Harbor Deepening, James River. Give me another big project that you guys are working on. Um, the Skiffs Creek Third Port Improvement Project, where John Jones is, it, it's a Milcon project, but it has a lot of marine construction features to it in terms of dredging, placement in the upland site, as well as um, removal of sheet piles. So the engineering folks had asked us to be a part of that team, and, and, and we're glad to assist. Well, out, of all, out of these three main projects of many that you have, um, what are what are our Norfolk District engineers doing? Like, how is this going to um, make our the, the Commonwealth, the communities, and the country a better place? Well, it all you know, of course, navigation um, is the is is the focal point, and we're looking for unrestricted navigation. Um, so for each for each of those aspects or for each of those projects, there's a customer or end user um, that uses that particular channel, and in, in, in particular for the Atlantic Ocean Channel as well as the Norfolk Harbor Inner Channel and the and, and Channel to Newport News. I mean that's the entire Port of Virginia. So what we're doing is we're improving uh, the channel for a 55 foot project to allow larger vessels to call on the port. And to me, that's a that's a big mission. So that's that's going to bring more business. That's going to boost the economy. That's going to provide for safe transit of those deep draft vessels. Because the the vessels are getting bigger. They are yes. getting bigger. Like like everything else, everything's getting bigger. So we're we're here to accommodate that, and that that sounds like it's going to have a huge you know economic impact. On, like we said, on the communities, the Commonwealth, and and the country. We're going to take a little break right now. I'm going to shift the camera to get a different view. And uh, we're going to talk about the people. We're going okay. to get a little more in depth, so I'm going to give you some time. All I'm right. going to... Back to Ohio, that's how far you <laughs> got to shift it. Okay. So, yes, we are talking a lot about the engineers. This is, this is a piece for Engineers Week as well. And... It's, I think it's important for us to tell folks like the engineers that work with the engineers on your team. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about them as a whole. What kind of people are they? What is their motivation, their drive? Um, tell us a little bit about your team. Well, sure. So, you know, Steve Powell uh, has been with the section when I started in, back in 2002. So um, he, he brings a lot of wealth of institutional knowledge and experience. Um, Great negotiator, great uh, calm demeanor. Uh, he keeps things uh, smooth. Joe McMahon, again, calm demeanor. I mean, he's relatively new. I mean, I've just hired 
three new engineers, uh, Joe McMahon, Jake Landis, and Tom Lehman. Um, they probably have been with Design Section for all of four months, but uh, what they all have demonstrated is technical ability. You know, they have great instinct, they're great engineers, um, you know, but you don't come into the Design Section and know a lot about dredging, so you still have to build that bench. You also uh, don't know a lot about the Civil Works process or the Corps of Engineers, so if you're a new employee to the Corps, all those things need to be uh, developed. But again, they're starting great engineers, great team players, and I can't emphasize that more than anything else, and just a, just sort of a, a good resiliency in terms of they um, handle everyday stress just with a calm demeanor, and they have, and, and they're balanced. What are some of the methods that you employ or, or um, that you try to institute to keep that team as hard as it gets and as hard sure. as it can be and as long as it can be, how do you keep them motivated? How do you help keep them where they're feeling like they're, um, they have worth and they're valued? And, um, like we talk about resiliency. Well, so the first thing, just the obvious, is I tell them that they have worth and that they're of value and that they're doing a great job. Um, I also try to spend as much time with them as I can uh, to work with them on their projects. I try to reinforce the importance of the work they're doing in terms of how it fits into the overall mission for the Norfolk District and Corps, as well as how, how important it is to our customers. Well, I, I started earlier by saying how we're so busy right now and things can get a little stressful on a daily basis, even in a remote environment, and I tell them that as the project manager or the leader of the team, that they're setting the tone. So when things are getting hectic, I said it's okay to take a pause, to step back, analyze what's going on, and don't overreact, and again, just to stay calm. And just, to me, I, that is so important. It's just over the years I've learned that that, that calm demeanor is so helpful and productive because you know everything's going to go up and down, but you know. But yeah, I said setting the tone um, for the rest. That's a big responsibility. So you're kind of like the leader of these younger, or you know, especially the newer guys, guys being that long. Do you guys? What do, I mean? Is well, 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 I told them. And I didn't mean to interrupt you, but but I but I told them to step back, and I need to follow that same advice. You know, so. I am, you know, all, you know, constantly just trying to keep and be resilient and not wear my emotions on my sleeves um, because, again, I, I actually love the mission, I enjoy the work, and I need to remember that and focus on that and maybe want to convey that, you know, you know, to the team. Why do you like being, why do you like what you do? Well, we were talking earlier um, about advancement, and I've been here since 2002. I, I worked for the Corps of Engineers starting back in 96, and I moved around a lot and, until I came to the Norfolk District. I really love the, the navigation mission. Um, more importantly, though, it's the people that work here and the customers that I work with and the customers I work for. Oh, we know what we talked about what I thought was really neat, let me see if I can find the exact, I've mixed these notes with like my home notes because I was like, kitty litter, straight in that bathroom, that's not my home notes at <laughs> yeah. all. Um, you had mentioned kind of keeping, especially with, yeah, here we go, especially with some of like the newer guys that you brought on, like being there but not micromanaging and that balance, which I thought was right. really amazing. Talk to me. Talk to me about that. Sure. So, um, and I'll just give some context. Earlier in my career, I've experimented with many different types of styles for leadership. I have been known to micromanage. Um, it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't promote empowerment. It doesn't uh, promote trust. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't really promote teamwork. So, what I try to do um, with the folks in design section is, you know, here, you know, kind of give them an intent or goal, not tell them how to do something, but tell them what really needs to be achieved uh, because the way I do something, you know, it works, but they are new and innovative and they're probably going to come up with a way to do it better. 
And um, I'm just sort of, you know, giving them that intent, answering their questions when they need it. Um, I kind of know when a project's on track or not on track. And so I'll, I'll intervene when I need to, just to make sure that they're staying on track. But again, I don't like to tell people what to do. I don't like to tell people how to do it. I do from time to time if there's a really urgent need. Um, um, but mostly it's just allowing those folks to grow professionally and personally, work within a team, checking up with them from time to time or when they need to talk. Um, I always try to make myself available, whether it's a five-minute MS Teams chat or a formal meeting. That's just how, you know, because, so before COVID, I like to walk around the cubicles and just talk to everybody, and you can't do that now. So, uh, and hopefully we're getting back to that. But, but I, I find that MS Teams works almost just as well. How do you, do you ever have a situation where one of your PMs is going to do something and you're like, oh, you know, the butt, you're like, or, or you're not that... Uh, so when I have a teammate that's pro when it, when I have a teammate that's proposing something where I think there's some risk, I will let them know, hey, I think I think there may be some risk. I want you to, to consider these things, and if you can address these things, then you're solid. Um, I don't want to tell them no, that's a bad idea. I I, I don't like to I, I just don't like to say that. It's just not productive. It's not constructive. Behind the scenes, there is such a hard-working, professional group of people that are serving the customers. So when the customers are getting a regulatory permit, or they're getting a 408 permission signed by Colonel Hallberg, or they're getting a plans and specs, just know that, I mean, that just a lot of hard work and effort went into that. And these, and these folks really care about what they do, who they are, and, and who they um, are representing. I'd like to send out a special thank you to Eartha Garrett, Barry Kimbrough, Jory Bunn, Mike Anderson, Colonel Brian Hallberg, Jay Walker, and my boss, the leader who talks me down off the edge every month while making this podcast, Mark Haviland. Until next time, this is Fortress.